As implied by the title, I'm here today to discuss drugs. No, not those sorts of drugs, the drugs that are inextricably linked with the university lifestyle, <laughs> but rather these types of drugs, or at least I'm told that's what they look like. Of course, I, I wouldn't have the foggiest notion myself. You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> anyway, these are the types of drugs that sadly these days are inextricably linked with elite athletic performance. Setting the scene, a 1995 survey by Dr. Robert Goldman uh, got 198 athletes of various sports, most of them US Olympians at the time, and asked them whether they would take a banned substance that came with two guarantees. One, you will not be caught. Two, you will win. Only three said no. When the second guarantee was altered to you will win every competition you enter for the next five years and then you will die from the side effects of that substance, more than half of the respondents still said yes. The story of doping is long and illustrious, certainly way before this was ever considered a sport. <laughs> the first documented deaths from performance enhancing drugs, henceforth PEDs, predate even the birth of the modern Olympic Games. However, it was around about the 1950s that there seems to have been a real proliferation of doping. And it wasn't until around about the late 1960s did sports various governing bodies actually spring into action to try and discourage doping in any meaningful way. And the history of drugs in sport governance since then is that policy of the day has lagged abysmally behind the decision-making processes and actions of professional athletes and their support group members, coaches, medicos, etc. Nowadays, we have an extensive system of testing and penalties. Now, any of you who may be familiar with the prisoner's dilemma from economic game theory will know that outside intervention in this manner is necessary to rid drugs from sport since the athletes themselves are presumably incapable of doing so by way of tacit collusion. Furthermore, future proposals or proposals for future reforms from one end of the scale, um, complete amnesties in exchange for complete truth about when they were taking the drugs, right up to suspending all of the members of the team for one offence at the more draconian end of the scale, all fail to tackle the incentive problems more directly. And in the absence of having been able to select genetically superior parents, these fallen stars will invoke any old excuse for succumbing to the temptations of doping, whether it be weakness, stupidity, or just plain insanity. <laughs> and while athletics has in the past had its fair share of indiscretions, swimming also, perhaps football uh, a little bit less so, it seems all too often that it's been this sport that has, more than any other, a never-ending rap sheet on doping. So much so that after reigning champion Floyd Landis had his title stripped, in advance of the 07 Tour de France, all 189 riders in the field freely and willingly signed a personal pledge that they were not using PEDs. What a marvellous gesture. <laughs> and now they've actually put their name on a piece of paper that says they're clean, so you can believe it. Yes. Fascinatingly, in that particular year of the Tour de France, the average speed of winner Alberto Contador was less than 39 kilometres per hour. The only time that has happened since 1994 making it the slowest Tour de France in nearly the last two decades. Now, whether of course that was due on one hand to 
the writers wanting to keep a straight face when they signed that personal pledge and how much of it was due to the tougher testing standards in place in the wake of the scandal that had engulfed the tour in the previous instalment of the race is far beyond the scope of this talk. Sadly, this has all become very topical once again very recently, uh, coincidentally after I'd accepted the invitation to talk about this topic today. Ostensibly because of this man. Yes, you guessed it, our friend Contador again, who until about six weeks ago, the record showed to be the 2010 Tour de France champion. Now, that is no longer the case. He's been relegated to the status of merely a two-time winner of the world's premier road cycling event. Now, relevant administrative bodies, such as the uh, WADA, the, the World Anti-Doping Agency, um, Cycling Peak Body, the UCI, and also the IOC, have all sought inadequate input from economists as to how to curb the scourge of PEDs. Nobel laureate Gary Becker wrote about the penalties angle as early as 1967, while Ed Lazier spoke about uh, elements of this particular idea underpinning the talk today in his seminal 1979 paper in Journal of Political Economy. A fundamental economic problem with the current penalties, principally suspensions, is that while they do serve as a deterrent, they're not the same deterrent for everybody. And so at this stage, I'm going to make mention of something that you might imagine economists to be more predisposed to muse over, superannuation, hence the title of this talk. A question you might be pondering right now is, what on earth has super got to do with drugs in sport? Well, consider who is taking the PEDs. Now, we can't observe what is concealed, that's for sure, but what we can observe is who gets caught. And what we do know is that compared to the overall population of cyclists on the professional circuit, the mean age profile of known offenders is older. Now, the key to understanding why this is the case lies in the economic concept of opportunity cost. If I'm a 32 or 33 year old rider, uh, the opportunity cost to me of taking drugs and maybe getting caught and suspended for a couple of years is extremely low, especially if I was going to retire in six months anyway. Whereas that same opportunity cost for an up and coming 21 year old is potentially profound, even after when you consider that uh, they can come back from a, a suspension a few years later, but even then they might never prove to be quite the same cyclist as dictated by their potential in the counterfactual. And that's simply by virtue of just missing all of those years of competitive racing and experience at the elite level. Therefore, you need a supplementary policy to offset this. One that imposes greater opportunity cost on older and more experienced riders specifically. And so, the big fat idea is that you decree all cyclists forego a nominal percentage, let's say 10% of their prize money, and if endorsements, if possible, to be placed into a fund managed in trust with the termination value distributed to the rider, let's say five years after they retire, if and only if they maintained a perfectly clean career record. If they get caught doping, even once, they lose the lot. Think about that one. <laughs> now this is subject, of course, to um, getting agreement from all of the relevant stakeholder groups, not least of all the cyclists themselves. And you may be inclined to think that it would be impossible to get the cyclists to agree to such an undertaking. But then again, given the precedent that they set themselves back in good old 07 when they pledged <laughs> cleanliness and willingly signed their name to a piece of paper, well, refusing to do so makes them run a significant risk of looking highly hypocritical in the eyes of cycling fans worldwide, who, by their demand, and let us not forget this, ultimately provide the means from which they can make a living through the sport. Well, the economic reasoning might be sound, but how could we determine uh, 
the efficacy or otherwise of such a policy proposal. I suspect that the leading candidate for this from the economics discipline comes in the field of experimental economics, which uses experiments in computer laboratories, much like this one, and the subjects are usually first or second year undergraduate economic students for a few simple reasons. They're cheap, they're available, and they're still uninformed enough not to be able to manipulate the experiment for personal gain. Such an experimental design in this case might involve, let's say, an hour-long experiment with 15 periods, each of four minutes duration, with a single decision involved. Cheat versus clean. All of this highly analogous to an annual decision made by a cyclist or any other professional athlete over a 15 year career. Some other assumptions would also be required here, such as two separate earnings profiles that hopefully will mirror as best as we can observe from actual data, the earnings profile of the athlete's life cycle. Now I did say two, of course we would need a second one for the athletes taking drugs, that is of course higher than at any stage of the equivalent clean earnings profile. And to this end, the rational cyclist would always cheat every single time, right? If you consider that their objective or the objective of the subject in the experiment would simply be to maximise the time discounted sum of their annual earnings, i.e. their overall career earnings. Now, given that the rational cyclist would always choose to cheat, you would need to build in some kind of positive probability of detection of cheating, coupled with some kind of exclusion for two periods or three periods, uh, at, during which the subject's earnings collapse to zero until they are allowed to re-enter the experiment. And this kind of setting could be used to compare attitudes to risk, not only under the current policy versus the super policy, but also under different variants of the super policy, as the model parameters, such as the probability of detection of cheating and the suspension length themselves vary. Anyhow, the bottom line is that this can all be done. To give you a bit of a visual as to how the results of such a 15 period experiment might work, except measuring something very different in this case, uh, specifically prices. This figure comes from a study by Haruvi and Nusser and appeared ultimately in the highly esteemed Journal of Finance in 06. They get their subjects to trade an equity-like security that pays dividends every single period and then has a zero end value. And while the fair value of the security at any period in time is plotted by this dotted line that you see down here, their experiment shows quite clearly that as the early dividends begin rolling in, irrational exuberance gets the better of our traders and they begin to bid the price of this security up to obscenely unsustainable levels. But at around about the half hour mark, they begin to realise that the number of dividends remaining is diminishing rapidly and the price collapses back to around about fair value with 15 to 20 minutes left and stays around about at that level thereafter. Anyway, this is a really nice depiction of bubble and crash behaviour in financial markets and we don't have to think too far back in history to remember this writ large in real life. Anyway, this demonstrates that such a 15 period experiment or something similar can tell a really nice little story about individual decision making. But I'll conclude where I started, drugs in sport. One of the things that the current suite of policies lacks a little bit is balance between both carrot and stick. And one of the things we know in economics is that the behavioural effect of things like taxation policies is greater with said balance. The super policy for drugs would actually allow us to build in some of the latter by incentivising riders to stay clean, knowing that there promises to be a nest egg in store for them post-retirement if they do.
And this is a particularly elegant little outcome given the wealth of knowledge we have about case studies of professional athletes in various sports who are highly profligate with their wealth during their careers. And so a little bit of financial management might actually serve to make all professional cyclists better off as well as drug free. Thanks for listening.